Yeah. Go away. Okay. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hey, we're all back. Yay. Hi, Thank everyone. You. Welcome to this week's Learning in Space. My name is Nicole Gallucci with CosmoQuest. Uh, this is our weekly show about all things science and astronomy, education, and outreach. Uh, if you guys want to participate, ask questions, leave comments, you can do so using the Q&A app through Google+. Uh, if you're watching this embedded anywhere or on YouTube, you can click on the Q&A app on the video to uh, do that. I see a couple of you are commenting already. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Guido. Uh, uh, I've seen an error from Jeff, but uh, that the er um, Hangouts seems to be having a little bit of a problem today, um, but we are running uh, internally, so hopefully you guys can comment and let me know if, um, if uh, we're coming through yet. <laughs> so, okay. I know the comments are a little bit delayed, so just pop in when you can. Uh, I have with me today Douglas Arian here. Or here. I don't know what side he's on for you guys. <laughs> welcome. Thank you for coming back to the show, Douglas. Very welcome. Very happy to do this. So you are uh, from Carthage College and uh, involved in the Galileo Scope project. And I know you had some um, some updates and things you wanted to talk about regarding the Galileo Scope. So first, can you explain with Galileo Scope for any any new viewers who uh, don't know what that is? So. Um, Hopefully everybody remembers the 2009 was the International Year of Astronomy, Yay. and for the uh, yes, great uh, for the IYA, there were a handful of worldwide what were called cornerstone projects, the big efforts that were put in place to promote astronomy. And there was a group that thought that you know one of the most important things would be that everybody should have a telescope to go and look at the sky. But if you look out and you look at inexpensive telescopes, there were very there was very little out there that was actually good quality and inexpensive. So a couple of us got together and designed a telescope to do that. It had to be very inexpensive. It had to be very high quality. We wanted to be a kit, one of education materials, and so we went ahead and did that. And uh, to to make a long story short, there are over two hundred thousand of them in one hundred and six countries right now. Wow! Uh, that we've distributed. Um, and if you go to the website GalileoScope.org. Uh, you can order them by the case there. There's a list of dealers you can get them from. There are also links to a lot of education materials, lesson plans, observing guides, optics, exercises, all sorts of great things, and instructions, and I think we're up to 12 or 14 languages up there. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, really pretty exciting, pretty exciting thing. So even though we did that for the IYA, we continue to distribute, and, and um, countries all over the world are still using them. Brazil huge education effort there. They bought thousands from us. Uh, I was in Mexico last year. They bought a thousand for the state of Yucatan for their schools. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's all over the world. It's really, really cool. Very exciting. That's Love excellent. Love we have a stash here. I'm at uh, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. We have a stash here. Uh, and I think we may be ordering more. We're doing a summer camp called um, Eyes on the Universe. Uh, where the kids will be doing optics experiments and building their own Galileo scopes and getting to take them home. So I'm really excited to be on the planning end of that. Uh, and the Galileo scope makes it so that I like the build it yourself aspect. Um, having a little bit of instrumentation background, I like that. That and uh, the fact that the kids can do experiments with it. Um, so uh, what 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 what's new? What, what, are there any updates in the Galileo scope world? You see, you have over two hundred thousand that have gone out. That's amazing. Yes. Exactly. So let's see, the big updates on Galileo Scope, well, update number one is we're still making them, we still have them in, in inventory, so if you need them for your camp, just order them and they'll be on their way. Sure. Um, we're working with, um, is actually an engineering graduate from Lehigh to develop a little mount, an actual an inexpensive oh. mount to go with Galileo Scopes. Uh, we're still working on getting that design done and getting it quoted out and trying to get those produced, but it's something that's, you know, we're, we're hoping to bring out this coming year and oh, have that's them. Great. Cool. 2015, which is a big year that we'll talk about in a little bit, yeah. um, and and really that's that's one of the next big things is the International Year of Light, and we're hoping to make Galileo Scope a cornerstone project for that as well. So trying to bring optics education out there. So it's the same tool, but with new materials and new instructions and new activities to be used more as an optics education kit. Uh, but that's that that's the big stuff that that that's coming along right now with with Galileo Scope. So we're we're planning another production run this year, so we have a you know few thousand inventory, but we're hoping to make another big batch uh, later this year. So that, that'll be pretty exciting. 
That's excellent. I have a Galileo scope in my garage with my collection of telescopes <laughs> that all live in the garage. Um, and uh, I was actually helping someone at a star party put together uh, kind of a cheaper, smaller department store telescope last night. And I remembered using one of those telescopes as a kid and being really frustrated. Right. Uh, and, and the Galileo scope, although small, is super sturdy. Yeah. Um, which which is really fantastic. And it's nice to just kind of hold it up and look, but you really do want a tripod. Um, I've been using camera right. tripods. Right. I, I, think mm -hmm. that's what we're, I think that's what we're giving the, the kids in the summer camp. We're giving them camera tripods <laughs> to, to do it with. Uh, well, we can link you up with uh, suppliers of, of inexpensive but very good tripods to let Ooh, us know. Yeah. That would be really cool. I'll have to Definitely email Definitely contact us. We'll do that. And, that. and that's the community as a whole. I mean, we have linkages to it. And I think there may be a link on the website. If not, uh, we can send you send the information on that, so that's very cool. You know, it's fun to see what people have done with Galileo scopes. Go to do a Google Images search on Galileo scope, and it's amazing. You'll see people virtually all over the world, kids, adults, schools, everybody using them, and then there are other people who've gone and used them for things. So people are now using them to, to build auto guiders for their telescopes mm. because it's the most cost-effective 50-millimeter refractor you can get, and they put their auto guider in the back in it and rings, and all of a sudden you have this, you know, $10,000 telescope with a $25 Galileo scope on the side of it being the auto guider, which is pretty oh, awesome. Sad. You see it being used in a lot of different places, so it's very cool, very, very cool. Yeah, um, I've even seen it used in, in cosplay. Uh, Pamela had a steampunk, Pamela Gay had a steampunk astronomer costume, and she painted hers bronze <laughs> to, there you go. to there carry you go. around with her costume. Yeah, yeah, so that was that was really cool. Cool, so, so what's happening in 2015? Uh, what What is the big event uh, related to telescopes? Exactly. So that's a great uh, lead into that. So just as 2009 was the International Year of Astronomy, like 1956 was the International Geophysical Year, mm -hmm. 2015 is going to be the International Year of Light, and that's being sponsored by the European Physical Society, EPS. Again, another worldwide experience to promote optics and photonics, which is really very cool when you think about the fact that, you know, our most important, well, I can't say most important, but... You know, really important sense is sight. You know, vision and optics are a very important part of everything every day. So um, there are going to, again, be a series of cornerstone projects. They're still developing what they are that are going to be out there to promote light and optics. And light and optics is, includes things like, you know, lasers and fiber optics, you know, be beyond, you know, just telescopes. Right, right. Uh, but the Galileo scope, which was designed as an optics kit, fits into that really, really well. So we're hoping to be able to, to, to partner with that. So uh, everybody should be on, on the lookout later this year, later in 14, for announcements of what the big global projects are going to be in 2015. But what a great opportunity to engage people with all sorts of things, because you can play with lenses, you can play with lasers, you can get you know, optics effects in the atmosphere. It's, you know, it's cool to see a ring around the sun that's from ice crystals and rainbows and all these other things that are all part of optics. It will be really, really neat and exciting. So it's a, another great opportunity for everybody to engage the public with science around the clock with all sorts of cool things that you could do. That's really great. Yeah, it sounds like a, it's a really broad topic um, that covers a lot of different science and engineering disciplines. How did this get started? I don't, to be honest, I don't know the 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 who initiated that. I mean, I was part of the IYA, so I know all the politics of, of, of how that got put through the UN. Right. You know, all the international years have to go to the United Nations, and, and they certify it first, and then it goes out to the member countries who each then acknowledge that they're going to be part of the international year. So I'm not sure who started the IYL, okay. um, but um, I said it, it, the European Physical Society is, is sort of the home base for it. So uh, everybody should just, you know, if you just Google, you know, yes, uh, yeah, if I, EPS I, and IYL, they'll, they'll come up with the, the site. I Googled it. International Year of Light, and the EPS site was the first hit, so that should, and mm -hmm. I've, I've included the link in the comments, and they'll be in the show notes as well. Great, great. So everybody should take a look at that and think about how they can engage with that. You know, the nice thing about an international year is, as opposed to just doing an event that's just kind of, oh, we're going to do this event, by promoting it through the international year, you'll get a bigger audience, and you know, an ability to link into other people that are doing really, really cool things. So here, you know, compared to the astronomy side, here there's a definite industrial side to it because there are companies that do optical things, you know, whether it's LED bulbs to lenses to fiber optics, you know, uh, optical computing. I mean, there's so much stuff that goes on in optics. There's really a lot of opportunities to do, to do cool things with people. So hopefully everybody will. 
Excellent. Yeah, we have uh, one of the physics professors here plays with giant lasers, so I'm sure he's going to find a way to, to get involved with that. Absolutely. Well, I mean, from an astronomy point of view, anytime I do uh, outreach programs, and we'll talk about that later, the thing that everybody loves probably more than anything else is the green laser point. Yes! <laughs> I was just doing that last night. They were like, whoa! And after you turn that, I was like, what was that? Isn't that cool? It's like they're not even looking at what you're pointing at. It's like nope. green laser pointer. You have to have a few minutes just to introduce the pointer because they're not looking at what you're pointing at. They're like, oh, my God, lightsaber. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, and actually, you know, that that's a great opportunity for people. You know, mm -hmm. green laser pointers are out there. They're not that expensive. Having one, yes, you can do astronomy with it, but you can show all sorts of great things you know, using that because it's so bright. So it's, that's very cool. So, yeah, green laser pointers are a big hit with the public of all ages. It's not just little kids. No. Adults are like, what is that? That's so cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just really be careful. Cool. Don't point in the direction of planes. You know, be safe. Follow legal guidelines. <laughs> yeah. I know there are, some, there are some power restrictions on them. I don't know what they are right now, but I didn't get in trouble with campus police last night. So. Well, that's that's I was showing him the planets. I take out the laser pointer. I was like, oh, I didn't think about that, did I? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It all went well. It all went well. Um, so, of course, light is a very important topic in astronomy. What are some of... So, Galileo Scope is, is working it to be a cornerstone because light telescopes astronomy, of course. Um, what other ways is, is uh, astronomy going to, do you think, going to be folded in? Um, the other big area that I know is going to be worked on is dark skies preservation, which mm -hmm. is using light in a healthy way as opposed to an unhealthy way. So not just that you get the sky back, but the fact that you know the misuse of light is actually an issue for the health of people, the health of animals, right. you know, energy expenditure, and so on. So that's going to be a big, uh, a big theme, I think, that's going to come through there. So Connie Walker, who's at NLAL, is going to be leading that. Um, also, uh, the main IAU contact for the IYL is Richard Green, mm -hmm. who is also the, uh, one of the people in the um, American National Society Dark Skies Preservation Working Group, which is Richard, Connie, myself. So, you know, we're all part of that. So it, I, I try to participate in as many things as I can to, you know, to promote this. So um, uh, I don't know how many of your viewers, listeners know about the International Dark Sky Association, the IDA, it's darksky.org. If they don't know about it, they should know about it. It's very, very important for astronomy and energy saving and the environment, and people should look at that. There's a lot of useful information there. So that's going to be another part of the IYL, is getting people more to understand that you know, light is good, too much light is not only not good, it can be bad. It's and bad, yeah, it could be dangerous, it's costly. Uh, it affects wildlife and it affects astronomy. There's there's so much there. Exactly. So so there's a lot of reasons to to educate people about that and and, and good use of light. So hopefully that'll happen. That's excellent. I'll get some people under there. So, so of course, when I think about light, uh, since my background's in radio astronomy, I think of it containing the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Is this going to be focusing mostly on visible, or is there going to be a bit a wider uh, wavelength range to the to the activities and and types of focus that that's a, that's a good question. Um, I know the main IYL area will be visible light. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the working group that I'm on also addresses the whole electromagnetic spectrum. In fact, one of the things that's been brought up is the fact that now that lots of cars have little radar thingies in there so that you don't bump into the car in front of you, that actually is now going to create a whole new collection of radio pollution. Oh. <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the good news about it is the beams are very directed. Mm -hmm. The bad news is if you happen to be looking, you know, down the bore side of an instrument, you know, it, it, it's going to see it. The good news also is it's at ground level. Most of the time, radio astronomy, right. you're not looking close to the ground. Mm -hmm. But uh, you do have sidebands. So that's one of the things you have to look at. Your arrays do have sidebands, which normally aren't an issue because you're not getting much in-band interference. Now you're going to have a new source mm -hmm. of in-band interference. I'm sorry I didn't exactly make your day there, but it's something to look at. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, different observatories obviously have, have different ways of dealing with that. Uh, Green Bank, they restrict what vehicles can even get close to the telescope. They only have the diesel vehicles, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the diesel vehicles are from the 60s and still running, which is fantastic. Uh, and, and I think... Um, I mean, the other, like the square kilometer array, both sites are being built in the middle of the desert. 
Right. Um, so that's uh, an interesting, goes along with, with dark skies awareness is quiet skies awareness. So you get kind of both sides there. And, and, and in both ways. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, well, we're going to build the real astronomy facilities out in the middle of no place. But, I mean, you run out of places in the middle of no place. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and just because you say, well, we can protect the observatories by putting them someplace people aren't, well, that's good, but that doesn't really absolve the rest of the people from misusing the environment that, that's around them. Right. So hopefully, hopefully we can do both. Okay, very cool, very cool. Um, anything else relating to International Year of Light that we should look for? Um, I, to be honest, uh, they're really just getting organized now. So um, the, the, they don't have their Cornerstone project list up yet. Uh, okay. That's coming. So uh, it's one of those things that you should definitely check later this summer. I know there's a number of organizing meetings that are happening going you know, this month through June, the next three months. So after that, I think it will be a good time for you to look and see what, what what's coming up. But I think the important thing is for everybody as they think about next school year, for example, the 14-15 mm -hmm. school year and the 15-16 school year to know this is going on. It gives me an opportunity to talk science with kids. And it can be, as we said, optics is everything. If you're teaching biology, you can talk about, you know, you can talk about vision, but you can also talk about how ultraviolet and, you know, the effects on skin and what's ultraviolet and where does that come from. And you can talk about you know, lighting and health effects. And, I mean, there's a long list of things that you can do with light, no matter what area you're teaching. So uh, I hope uh, people think about that. Use it as a way to promote uh, promote understanding. It would be great. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, Galileo Scope's uses in education? Sure. So um, the, the first thing is that the Galileo Scope is sold as a kit. Mm -hmm. And that was... Intentional. It wasn't just a matter of, well, we can make it cheaper if it's a kit. Actually, it's harder to make when it's a kit than when it's a whole telescope. So, um, but as a kit, the idea being that as you assemble it, you, well, first, see all the parts that actually go into one. If you just get a telescope and you start looking through it, you're not aware of the fact that there are all these different lenses and what they do, for example. Mm -hmm. So by putting it together, you, you, you put in the objective. Hey, wait a minute. This is two lenses together. Why is that? And you can learn about you know, how lenses are put together, and the eyepiece, and the bar, all the different lenses that go into it. So it was always intended to be something that you learned how telescopes work and how optics work by putting it together. So that was one of our, our main goals. So you can use it as we're going to build a telescope and learn how telescopes work and do that part. You can say we're going to learn how lenses work. So as you put it together, you say, well, this is the main lens in the front. What does it do? You can hold it up and see that it makes a real image, and then you can look at that image. You can do a lot of different things with it. You can learn about well, what we call chromatic aberration, that one lens doesn't put all the colors together, but if you put two lenses together, you can make most of the colors come together. You can actually see that, and so on. You can do a lot of those things. So um, it's, it's really great. A number of people have written lesson plans to do that. They're linked on the resources link on our on our website. So if, if you're doing a class, you just have a kid at home and say, oh, let's get a Galileo scope and put it together, you can do more with it than just, well, we're going to put it together and have a telescope. So we try to do that. So that's one thing that goes on. The second thing is that um, one of our major consumer groups, if you will, has been education organizations. So I mentioned to you, in, in, at the end of 2012, I was down in Yucatan so they were having a big festival because it was going to be the end of the world, if you remember. I do, I do, I do. I was in a 24-hour hangout okay. for that. It was really pretty cool. We, we, we made it. Um, so they uh, certainly took advantage of that since it was a Mayan prediction, and that's the center of Mayan culture. They had a lot of things. But they bought a 1,000 Galileo scopes to put into the schools in one state in Mexico. And the point was, you know, teachers should know how to use these and then be able to teach their kids about optics and astronomy and so on. And, of course, the Mayan culture was very tied to astronomy, so it all works together really, really well. Um, Brazil, same thing. Uh, lots and lots of Galileo scopes going into schools. Um, Pakistan bought quite a few to put into their schools. Um, there are a couple of universities in the United States that, that buy them and use them in their classes. It's a great thing for introductory astronomy classes to buy them along with the textbook. You build a telescope and the student walks away with a real telescope at the end of intro astronomy. It's a really great thing to do. We haven't gotten too many schools to do that. I think it would be much better if they did. I think it's a better thing to get 
than a lot of the other things. It excites people. They put it together. They go look at stuff. Uh, I think we'd like to see more people doing that. So, um, you know, one of the major goals of the project was always to do science education, and I think uh, I think it's going okay. I'd like to see more, but you can never have too much. So, <laughs> all the science education. Uh, so you, it looks like the Teachers for Telescopes program is still uh, going along. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about that? So we launched um, together with um, Astrosphere New Media donation program. So during the International Year of Astronomy, people could buy Galileo scopes, but they could also donate money right. and have telescopes sent out. And what we did there was uh, enough money was donated to send 7,000 telescopes, and they went to South Africa. Uh, which and then they distributed them for free all over the place. Wow. Um, what we launched in 20, this is for 2012, was the Telescopes for Teachers program. Mm -hmm. So people can make tax deductible donations and designate a school or a teacher to get a Galileo scope. So if they donate to that, we'll then send a Galileo scope to that teacher or school. And uh, so you know, we, we've hoped that that would be a way to get more Galileo scopes into schools. There have only been a few donations. I wish more people would do that. It's, it, it's a way to really help science education, because teachers don't have the money to go buy them. You know, you sit there yes. and say, well, classes should have them. They don't have the money. Yeah. But the parents, you know, you look at it and say, hey, look, you know, for not much money, we can put, you know, a bunch of these in the classroom, and then they'll be there forever. It's not like, you know, they get used up. So uh, we'd like to see more of that happen. But that's telescopesforteachers.org, telescopes, digit for teachers.org. Um, and we're hoping to do, you know, another big version of that for the IYL. So Excellent. we're looking at something like that. So if you already have a Galileo scope, and I know a couple of people have been commenting that they either have a Galileo scope or they have other telescopes, uh, you can still donate one. Um, so that's really that's really important. Uh, we also have a comment from Jeff Jeff Setzer, who recognized Hi, my, I know you. <laughs> he recognized my T-shirt and said, "Nice T-shirt." We've used Galileo scopes at teacher workshops at Yerkes, so that's mm -hmm. the, the T-shirt I'm wearing. Um, it is indeed. I visited recently. Um, uh, there's also uh, looks like a new uh, Galileo workshop program. Is this also going along with the educators? It is. Um, so there are two gentlemen at National Optical Astronomy Observatories, uh, Steve Pompey and Rob Sparks, mm -hmm. who have done a lot of Galileo scope workshops. Uh, most of the ones they've done have been sponsored either by the Arizona Science Foundation, I forget what the exact name of it, but there's a big foundation that does it, uh, and through Rockwell, which has sponsored a lot of them in the Tucson area. And so they'll buy a batch of Galileo scopes, then do a workshop with teachers, and then a star party so that everybody gets to out under the sky with them. It's been a terrific program. So we said, hey, look, there's a lot of people who are getting Galileo scopes, schools, museums. It might be useful for them to be able to have a workshop like that so that people actually learn how to put them together, learn how to use them, learn how to teach with them. So we're, we're offering those workshops. It's partnered with um, the gentleman I just mentioned, uh, so an opportunity for people to say, hey, look, we want to buy a bunch. Well, we'd really like to train our teachers. What could you do? And they could approach us, and we would make that linkage so that they'd have the opportunity to get that kind of training. So hopefully uh, some folks will sign on to that as well. That's great. Yeah, so I got to that right from the main Galileo website over on the sidebar. You've got two-day workshops, uh, one-day workshop, uh, or online workshops. So if you have, if if the trainers are nearby, you can have someone come out to you or do it online, which is a really excellent, um, really excellent avenue. So and then you can add on a star party, <laughs> which is always the most fun of a part of putting it together. Is then hoping for clear weather so that you can actually take it outside and and uh, use it. That's right. That's right. So so hope for clear weather. So you said you did a little workshop yesterday and you actually had clear weather, which is pretty cool. Because that's oh, not yeah. that always happen. It was, uh, yeah, every two weeks I do a star party on campus um, and, you know, weather dependent and the last four have been clear. We've been really, wow. <laughs> the, we started off really bad having like to cancel one after the other, but the last four have been great. So uh, okay. we have a bunch of high school students that are taking an astronomy class and their teacher requires them to come to the observing sessions. So that's that's really great. We just have uh, an 8-inch Celestron out there. Um, so... <laughs> But it's been fun. That's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, speaking of observing, do you want to talk a little bit about the program that you're doing? I think we wrote a post about this on CosmoQuest, uh, the outreach yeah. event you're doing, the Appalachian outreach event. Right. So um, 
my, my main, well, I'm not main job. I have so many jobs, I can't decide which one is the main job. But, <laughs> but that which absorbs a lot of my time is a, a large public education and outreach program uh, that's funded by NSF that is a joint project between Carthage, which is the school that employs me, and the Appalachian Mountain Club, which basically runs all the nature and outdoors programs in the Northeast U.S. They were founded in 1876 as the country's oldest and most established nature education, nature preservation, outdoor recreation organization in the country. Um, so uh, I approached them a couple of years ago and said, well, you do all these great nat nature education programs, but you don't have astronomy. Would you be interested in that? And they thought it was just a wonderful idea. Excellent. Uh, so I got NSF to fund it. So Carthage physics and astronomy students who do research with me, so I was just a kid peak week and a half ago, as a matter of fact, where, by the way, we got one night out of three clear. Oh, gosh. Well, we got one night, and uh, we can't share screens because I just crunched up the main um, image uh, uh, you know, all night on one planetary nebula that we're studying. But, but all there my is a screen share option over on the left. There is a screen share option on the left. This would be kind of cool. We can show people. It looks I like a little green out. with an arrow. Green with an arrow. Coolness. There we go. Ooh. Oops, let me put can, it up. can people see that? Yeah, yeah, I've put that on the main screen. What is that we're looking at? So that is a uh, planetary nebula denoted NGC 2730, 2371 and 2. So we'll do a little astronomy here in the midst of all this. But um, the NGC catalog is a list of objects that were mostly found by William and John Herschel mm -hmm. back in the 18th century. And... Um, can they see my mouse moving too? Is this yes. real? Yeah, okay. they can see that. So you see this blob here and that blob here. Those were the only two things they could see, so they gave it two numbers. This oh. is 71 and 2372, because they couldn't tell that it was all part of this one big thing. Yeah. Um, and this is a planetary nebula, so that's the white dwarf right there, the, the, the remnant oh. that's left, and this is basically its guts that have spewed out and is now illuminating with the ultraviolet coming from here. And planetary nebula are very cool. They're very cool. Firstly, they don't last very long. This will be visible for 10 to 15,000 years. Which that's a blink of an eye, yeah. For something that's been around for billions of years, something that lasts 10,000 years is next to nothing, number one. Number two, only low-mass stars like the sun make them, so the sun is going to do this. So four and a half billion years, we're done. It's all over. The sun's going to do this. We're toast. So get your affairs in order. You've got four and a half billion years left. Um, they have some oddball shapes. This is one of those shapes. They come in about half a dozen different shapes, and nobody knows why. Mm -hmm. We still don't understand the different shapes that they have. And they're very hard to get a distance. Most planetary nebula distances are unknown. Oh, wow. There's no standard candles for them. White dwarfs come in many different brightnesses. These come in different sizes, different shapes, different speeds. So th there's been a lot of work done to try to understand how far away they are, which you'd like to know, because then you can figure out other cool stuff. So this particular one we've been studying, we did a study of this um, a number of years ago. Um, one of my students took a lot of data on this in oxygen-3, doubly ionized oxygen, to study the, the, you know, the emitting gas. Um, she is now... Uh, having graduated a few years ago, she is now an operator on the MMT, the world's eighth largest telescope, I think she operates. Which is oh. cool, one of my students. Cool. Um, this is in hydrogen alpha. Mm -hmm. okay, so this is in the red. And what we're going to do is we're going to composite this with the images that we took in oxygen-3, which tracks hotter gas, to try to understand, in this case, what's closer, what's farther away, what's the 3D structure. Because mm -hmm. we don't know what it looks like in 3D. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So this is um, about two and a half hours of exposure with a one-meter telescope at Kitt Peak. Wow. Um, well, it, that's the total exposure over many sub-exposures. Right, uh, right, right. And I just, just composited it this morning because it takes a while for the machine to crank through it, so I set it up while I was doing other things. Uh, so that, that, that's all I can tell you now because we haven't done anything with it except we finally got it all composited from last week's run. Look at that, guys. Fresh data. Fresh data off the telescopes. Fresh, absolutely. Very, very fresh data. So, anyway, um, let's see. Um, I don't know how to get back on here. Uh, you can click screen share again, and it'll go away. Woo, it stretches funny. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, we so, in any, we, we got a little off track there, but um, this, 
uh, Carthage students who've done research with me are eligible to be interns with me in the outreach program. So two or three Carthage students spend the summer with me in New Hampshire with the Appalachian Mountain Club doing public education and outreach. They have telescopes set up all day and every night, as long as it's clear. They do solar observing. They do stellar observing. We um, do programs for camp groups, visiting groups. We train all the AMC guides, naturalists, hut crews. Uh, so I'm doing a program Saturday evening for 150 of their naturalist volunteers. They have a group of volunteers who do programs, so I'm training them. We've installed telescopes. Oops, sorry about um, Hopefully that will go away. So do you need to get that? <laughs> no, I don't. I just don't want it to be making noise in the background. We'll just have to live with it. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm doing a program to train 150 of their volunteers on Saturday. We have telescopes installed at all of their facilities, including their high mountain huts up in the White Mountains. Mm -hmm. So uh, we reach, the this is the third year of the program. The first year we did programs for 3,000 people. Last year it was 5,000. We're gunning for 10,000 this year. Um, okay, you can be quiet now. Thank you. <laughs> Talk to technology. It works. Um, Why it happened? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, anyway, uh, that, that's my major effort now is doing public science education because it's desperately needed. Um, the programs that I run when I do the public lecture programs, uh, I always uh, tell people at the beginning it's the most atypical astronomy presentation they'll ever hear because it's astronomy, but it's much more tied into you know, one unified picture of how nature works, that things aren't the way they are independent of what's out there. The fact that, you know, Human color vision exactly matches the spectrum of the sun at 6,000, you know, K. Right. Uh, I point out to them, for example, the movie Contact, if anybody remembers Contact, and Jodie Foster allegedly goes to a planet around Vega, well, she wouldn't be able spoiler to see it. Spoiler alert! <laughs> yeah. yeah, spoiler alert. It's only been out for 20 years. <laughs> it's only been out for 20 years. But, I mean, for example, you know, Vega's a much hotter star than the sun. Her eyes wouldn't work very well. The spectrum's wrong. So pointing out that you know humans have evolved in a particular way to match what's out here, the the sequence of events that includes at least one supernova and several AGBs to produce you know the isotopes that we have here that we need to live you know to have calcium for strong bones and teeth as they say mm -hmm. you know the fact that that's all one story and that's what we try to promote to people to understand that it's not us and then there's astronomy it's there's one big system we're part of it and as we talked about with that planetary nebula. In four and a half billion years, we're going to get vaporized, and our parts are going to go out and condense to form some other star and planet somewhere else. Right. Well, we know we have, you know, dinosaur blood in us from a prior planet somewhere else. Uh, so uh, it, it gets people's interest, and, and, and I, I think that's important. And another big thing we do, we do a lot of dark skies education as part of it as well. Because a lot of people have come up to the White Mountains, they've never seen a clear sky before. They've never been in a dark side, yeah. so it's a pretty exciting thing to be able to do and then explain why it is that they don't see that everywhere mm -hmm. and how to fix it. So we do a lot of that as well. Yeah, I had that kind of experience in high school, and it was just, and then again in college, and it just blew me away. Um, just to see a dark, because I grew up in a city, to see a dark sky for the first time. Having had an interest in astronomy all my life uh, was, was really mind-blowing. Like, oh, you could actually, this is the Milky Way you guys were all talking about. <laughs> yeah. I didn't well, believe it. Well, there's a famous story. It was in uh, the 80s. I forget what year it was, but there was a big blackout in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And um, this was uh, height of the Cold War, you know, early 80s. And, and um, the, 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 the National Guard offices and the hospitals and the police, they were all inundated with phone calls from people who wondered if L.A. had been nuked because the lights had gone out and there was this eerie glow in the sky. Oh, my goodness. It was the Milky Way. They'd oh. never seen it. Wow. Yeah, I mean, the power went out in 2003 on a big chunk of the East Coast, and New Yorkers didn't know what to do with themselves. I was thrilled, of course. I dragged everybody outside, but uh, it was it was amazing to actually see so many stars above the city. Yeah, that's It was incredible. Cool. Yeah, hopefully, you know, blackout's not a good thing, but <laughs> there was a silver lining. Uh, so how can people um, get more information about these these programs? Okay, well, let's see. For, for all the things, Galileo Scope is galileoscope.org, mm -hmm. uh, telescope for teacherorg and I know you'll post those things up. Mm -hmm. uh, you've already put up the link for the International Year of Light, which is very cool. Uh, for the AMC programs, um, uh, the, the AMC's general site is outdoors.org. Okay. I highly recommend people just look at that. Uh, and then there's going to be outdoors.org slash astronomy 
which is a page we're just creating now. So if you go now, it's not it's just a schedule, but we're, we're going to be putting up a full page about the astronomy programs uh, in the next week or two. Um, and uh, we also have a lot of resources up for the outreach program at a site called amc-astro.org, amc-astro, amc-astro.org. Okay. And uh, folks are welcome to go there. And in fact, uh, the whole all the slides I use in these presentations are posted there, and links to sponsors and links to the IDA, all sorts of things are there. So we welcome fantastic. welcome visitors. Excellent. That's really cool. Uh, we have a question. Well, I'm sharing links uh, from from Jeff Setzer. Uh, Hi, Doug. I've got a case of Galileo scopes that will be a seed for a new and hopefully ongoing program at ncsf.info. Any recent programs you've seen with a handful of Galileo scopes? Programs? Yes. Um, uh, you're talking about um, outreach programs or what That's what, what it sounds like. Yes, Northern Cross Science Foundation. Uh, yeah, it looks right. like outreach programs. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there have been a, a suite of them that have gone on. Um, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, ASP, has distributed them through Project Astro. That's one of the main ones that's gone out. Uh, we use them, of course, with the AMC program, the, the programs that Steve Pompey does at NOAO, and I know he'd be very happy to share what they do and how they do that. So they could uh, easily contact Steve, and that's spompey, S-P-O-M-P-E-A, at noao.edu. Uh, and I'm sure he'd be happy to to provide information on what he's been doing. So it's, th those are some of the big established um, outreach programs that are being done with Galileo scopes there. Um, there is um, a, an entire workbook of things to do with it that's up on the website, so do take a look at that. That was put together by Tim and Stephanie Slater from the University of Wyoming. So, um, so they're welcome to go. That's downloadable right from the site, so that's a good place to go for it also. Uh, and, and Jeff has my contact information. He's welcome to email me, and I'll uh, give him more information or stuff if he'd like to have that. I'd be very happy to help out. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, I've done some of the activities actually at the last ASP meeting, I think, um, or, or the one before. I can't remember. Uh, Rob Sparks was running a workshop uh, showing the hands-on activities that you can do with the lenses from the Galileo scope before you actually put it together to teach optics. So I'm hoping to bring some of that to our summer camp here. Yeah, that's great. Rob does an amazing job. He, mm -hmm. he, he's absolutely the, the best at doing programs with Galileo scopes and optics. So they have the whole hands-on optics kit. Yes. yes. You know, an even more extensive uh, optics program is the hands-on optics kits, and I highly recommend that to people. There's also a dark skies preservation kit that NOAL puts out. That's right. Yes, uh, Connie showed us that on a gosh a previous episode. We uh, she had the whole setup, and we tur turned out the lights and went through with the little street lights and all of that. Um, is that that what you're thinking of with the little street lights and the building? Oh, that's a great demo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did that on video. That was pretty cool. What I'm trying to do with her, we're trying to improve the kit. Um, because one of the things I'd like to do with the kit is, you know, so you have a little mag light, that, that's the street light, and you can't see the little man, then you put the cover on and you can see the man. What I'd like to do is to be able to put the cover on and cut the voltage in half to show that oh. when you have a cover, you only need a bulb that's half as big to put the same amount of light on the ground. Yeah. So that's an improvement we're going to try. We have to figure out how to engineer that, but a way to put a dimmer bulb and show that you get yeah. more light on the ground with a dimmer bulb. So not only should you cover it to get the stars back, but you can also use a smaller bulb that uses less power and lasts longer. You should be able to put like a variable resistor in there. Something like that. Yeah, I'm going to modify it to do that. We're going to come up with a way to do that. So uh, cool. anyway, that's, uh, that, that stuff is great, and uh, we, we love doing those demos with people. And, and people get it. When you show them that, they go, oh, okay, I get it now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it's rare. I mean, people have all, I mean, I think people have all had that moment where they're blinded by a streetlight and can't actually see what's going on in front of them. So that, bringing that home with that demonstration is really important. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Very good. Safety is one of the big concerns when you when you talk about reducing light pollution. Uh, that, that I think that that's pe communities usually their biggest concerns. Oh yeah, safety, health, and money. I mean, protecting the sky is not, your average mayor doesn't care, but if it's uh, safety, health, and money, uh, in reverse order, money, health, <laughs> safety, uh, that's what usually gets people's attention. Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, looking ahead to see if there are any other questions, I know we've had a whole bunch of comments 
Um, you guys for working out. So apologies again if anyone's watching this after the fact and you couldn't get it to work, Doreen. Hangouts is doing something slightly funky today. Um, so hopefully you can catch up on the YouTube channel or the audio version on 365 Days of Astronomy. Um, what else? Uh, Q&A app. Uh, Guido Pieper says, full disclosure, I don't have a Gal Galeoscope, but I've always wanted one. It's never too late, Guido. Um, but he has a little uh, Newton uh, Newtonian that's always been enough for him. So that's cool. Uh, and also, laser pointers can get you into jail here in Germany. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Good to know. Don't bring the laser pointer to Germany. <laughs> and yes, outreach for, from Jeff uh, in your question, clarifying your question. Um, so that's all cool. So uh, if you have any last minute questions, send them in to us. Um, do you have anything else going on that you want to promote or uh, share with people? We've got well, a whole bunch of links to go in the show notes for this episode, so I'm really excited. The resources. Yeah. Yeah, we'll try to get people connected. Well, one thing for people to think about with graduations coming up, Galileo scopes are great graduation presents. Ah, oh, okay, there you go. If you have a kid who's interested in science, you'd like to get interested in science. Um, if you buy them directly from us, they come by cases of six. But if you get a couple of neighbors together or whatever, or you got a couple of kids, it's not. I mean, six isn't that many to distribute. Right. Uh, but you know, it's a great opportunity to to promote science with kids, and it's a good gift because. It's not just a toy that they'll use and then I'll grow. It's something that they can use indefinitely, hopefully. You know, we, we want it to be the entry-level drug to a great addiction to astronomy, and, and, right. and hopefully that will do it. So people can think about that. This is the season for that. It's the end of April. High school graduation, you know, middle school graduations, high school graduations, college graduations coming up. Think about that as, as a way to promote it. And, to, you know, everybody who's on here now has an interest in astronomy. They wouldn't be listening to us if they didn't. That's a great way to promote it. Uh, so I, I, I urge them to do that. And, and know that we're volunteers running it. We're, we're, we are not only not making money, we're, you know, we've sunk the money in to make it. So yes. um, it, it's not the same as supporting a commercial venture. It's really something that's being done to promote astronomy. So... Uh, I hope, hope, hope folks will do that. Excellent, do that. excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to put out a few announcements, and then we'll wrap up maybe with uh, one last uh, final thoughts about the, um, the upcoming International Year of Light and what that means to you. But first, I'll do some announcements. Uh, today is Wednesday, which means the next Hangout is Friday uh, at noon Pacific. That'll be the Weekly Space Hangout hosted by Fraser Kane. We'll be talking about the top news stories from the week. I say we, I don't mean me. I... I am going to be getting prepared for the big Hangout-a-thon. <laughs> um, so this weekend, April 26th and 27th, we're starting Sunday, uh, Saturday about 10 a.m. Central Time. So that's, I don't know what that is, GMT, 5 p.m. GMT. Uh, and we will be doing a 36-hour Hangout. <laughs> wow. um, it'll be uh, myself, Pamela Gay, uh, Phil Plate's involved, Fraser Kane's involved. I have no idea what else is going to happen because I haven't seen the schedule yet. <laughs> I'm just gonna mm, throw myself in there with everything. Uh, but we are. Uh, I've been. I've been on the back end for booking a few last minute guests this week. So we're gonna have some really fun guests again. Uh, we are going to have uh, some crafts, some sciency related crafts and maker things. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. This is all to help us raise awareness of science and astronomy education and to raise money for to keep the CosmoQuest Citizen Science going uh, because we, of course, have just released some really amazing science results and we definitely want to keep going and, and get more, recruit more citizen scientists to the cause. So uh, that's this weekend. Check the CosmoQuest page on Google+. Plus. Uh, I've been tweeting videos from last year's Hangout-a-thon, you know, memories, remember when, um, and all of that. Um, There'll be a virtual star party Sunday, whether or not it's... Uh, uh, there may be a virtual star party tied in with a Hangout-a-thon, uh, assuming we can get clear skies for some of our observers, but then the usual virtual star party happens Sunday night at about 8 p.m. Pacific. Uh, and then Monday, assuming that we're not all dead from the Hangout-a-thon, is the recording of Astronomy Cast um, with uh, Fraser and Pamela. Next Wednesday on Learning Space, uh, Georgia, and, Georgia will be back. Georgia and I will be talking uh, about telescopes for Tanzania, so a particular program getting telescopes out to Tanzania. So uh, we hope you can join us next week for that. Uh, Douglas, hopefully you'll be able to join us for the Hangout-a-thon. I don't remember uh, what we'll, the... we'll try. I, I, as I said, I'm going to be spending most of my time doing a big training program. Oh, for... that's right. That's right. That's right. 
So uh, I will be doing, uh, you know, accomplishing what we're all trying to accomplish here, which is spreading astronomy to the world. Excellent. So I probably will not be available, but I will try. I'll try to take a look at it. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have any last um, words about either Galileo scope or Year of Light or, or any of that? Uh, just uh, do, do look at all the various links that uh, Nicole's putting up so you can see what's going on. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions from anybody, so please feel free to forward those to me. Uh, and information anybody would like on those things, I'll be happy to link them up to it. Excellent. So uh, let me know how, how I can help. Great, great. Uh, do you have a contact, a way people can contact you that you'd like to share? Uh, the, the email address is the best way, and that's just darion, D-A-R-I-O-N, at carthage.edu. That's Excellent. the best way to reach me. And I'll right. do my best to get back to you as soon as I can. Excellent. So uh, we got a thank you from Nancy Graziano. Thanks for the great show. I can always count on it being information and educational. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and we will see you guys next week. Thank you, Douglas. You're very welcome. Take care. You too.